So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Jerome Martin from Institute de Astrophysique de Paris, uh, from Paris. His working area is theoretical cosmology. He mostly works on uh, inflationary cosmology, cosmological perturbation theory, and also uh, some related stuff with uh, quantum information theory, which he will talk about today. Uh, related to Bell's inequality and all. And uh, he belongs to the theoretical physics department, gravitation cosmology. He is the senior research member there. Uh, before joining uh, uh, this institute, he did his PhD from the University of Paris. Then he was a postdoctoral fellow at DNTP Cambridge. And then he joined in this institute. Everybody knows uh, about Jerome's work. He uh, uh, had written many, many interesting works and also his uh, uh, very uh, well-cited works. We are also following because I'm also doing the research in his area. So uh, he will going to speak about quantum mechanical perturbations and the pioneering role of John Bell uh, in cosmology. And thank you very much, Jerome, for agreeing to give this talk in QSTM forum. This is the 41th, 41st talk in the QS. Uh, is it 41? No, no, sorry, sorry. This is 44th uh, uh, talk in the QSTM forum. So I'm very happy that you have agreed to give this talk. And uh, we all are welcoming you from Potsdam Max Planck. So you can start. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, it's also a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to give, uh, to give this talk. So thanks a, a lot to you. Uh, it's great to be part of this very nice series of, of, of talks. So today, indeed, I want to they discuss- I just want to interrupt. Just look yes. into the camera a little bit below because we want to archive a picture of the speaker always. Uh, a little bit uh, left of your... Yeah. Like that? Yes. Okay. Okay. Is it Thank okay? You. Now you can continue. Sorry. Okay. No, you're, you're welcome. Yes, so as you can uh, read on the screen, what I want to do uh, today is to discuss the uh, quantum mechanical properties of the primordial perturbations. And this talk will have some overlap with uh, a previous talk by Vincent Venin, but hopefully I will uh, discuss some other aspects of the problem and hopefully this will be uh, useful uh, for you. So I have organized the talk in the following way. So in the first part, I will give you the motivations of this talk. Then in the second part, I will describe very briefly the theory of cosmological perturbations of quantum mechanical origin, since this is the main tool that I am going to use in order to discuss the, the main question of this talk. And then I will move to the main point, namely whether the perturbations uh, can be viewed as a quantum system or if uh, uh, at the effective level they can be described as a classical or a stochastic uh, system. And then, based on the discussion uh, that we are going to have uh, during this third point, I will move to the fourth point of the talk, where I will try to address the question of whether we can detect a direct signature of the uh, uh, quantum origin of the perturbations. And if time permits, at the end, I will round up very quickly with some uh, conclusions. So let me start with the first part, namely giving some motivations for the subject that I want to discuss with you today. So you probably all know that according to inflation, and in fact, it's not only according to inflation, but this is also true for uh, some alternatives to inflation, the perturbations uh, the cosmological perturbation and the large scale structures and the CMB anisotropies that we observe in our universe originate from quantum fluctuation of the gravitational 
and scalar fields. By scalar fields, I have in mind the inflaton field, the field responsible for inflation. Amplified by the mechanism of gravitational instability and stretched to very large distances, to cosmological distances by the expansion. So this is a very drastic statement because basically it means that everything we observe in our universe, again, all the structures that we uh, see in our universe are nothing but quantum fluctuations uh, uh, stretch on large scales. So this strong statement, as, as it is well known, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And so today I would like to discuss what are the evidence for this claim. Uh, well, a first thing that we can say is that if we postulate that this is true, then it seems that everything that can be inferred from this assumption are consistent with the observations. For instance, uh, if the perturbations are really of quantum mechanical origin, we can very easily uh, find out that the power spectrum of the fluctuation is almost scale invariant. And as we all know, uh, especially after the release of the Planck data, we all know that it fits well the data. So in some sense, we have indirect confirmation of the quantum mechanical nature of the perturbations. But here in this talk, this is something slightly different that I would like to do. Namely, I would like to discuss whether we can find a direct signature in the sky of the quantum origin of the perturbations. So Jerome, I have one question. Yes. Uh, so you have mentioned about this uh, uh, gravitational and the scalar fields that amplify. So I just want to ask that, uh, like we know that why we deal with scalar fields, but from the like uh, collider or something perspective, we have a uh, like handle in only for Higgs. We don't yes. need some other scalars and all. So like, like why we always uh, look for scalar fields, not some other thing uh, in this context. Uh, well, there are different answers to that question. Uh, well, first, if you want to uh, have inflation, uh, well, as you very well uh, know, you need negative pressure. Yes. And uh, in order to have negative pressure, because, because in, in the context of general, uh, general relativity, negative pressure means accelerated expansion, and accelerated expansion is by definition inflation. Uh, so, uh, as you well know, if you have a scalar field in a configuration where the potential energy dominates over the kinetic energy, uh, you exactly have a system which has at the effective level a negative pressure. And in addition, a scalar field is compatible with the symmetry uh, of a homogeneous and isotropic universe, so Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker universe. So this is why uh, a scalar field is a very natural candidate to be the source of inflation. No, I, now, I, other mode yes? Yeah, so I can understand this point. My yes. point was a little bit more, like Higgs actually confirms that the signature of the standard model of particle physics. Mm -hmm. But I'm uh, saying this thing because you know that there are certain frameworks from like string theory or many high energy theories gives certain uh, like potentials for uh, inflation. So mm -hmm. the signature of inflations uh, like is, is basically connected with the confirmation of those theories, existence of those theories? Not really, no. Uh, I mean, uh, we don't know exactly the physical, if, if this is your question, we don't know exactly the physical nature of the scalar field, which is yes, yes, for inflation. Yes. By the way, it could be, it could be the X field because, uh, I mean, uh, the Starobinsky model, which is one of the base model of inflation given the Planck data, is in some sense nothing but the assumption that the scalar field responsible for inflation is the X field. Uh, yeah. But it could be, uh, it could be, as you said, it could be uh, something else. For instance, a scalar field that comes from extension of the standard model of, of particles. And uh, as you said, uh, it, it could be one of these uh, scalar fields that naturally appears 
in the in string theory, for instance. So each of these model leads to different potential, and yes. different potential uh, lead to different pattern on the sky. So in principle, uh, from observing the the CMB anisotropy, we can guess the potential. In practice, of course, we only have constraints on the potential. And what we can do is rule out models. But um, so, so at, at this stage, we don't know what's the physical nature of the scalar field is. And it could be the Higgs or something else coming from a high energy extension of the standard model if this is the if this answers correctly what you were asking for. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you for them. So. Oh no, no, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, so the goal of this talk is, uh, as I was saying, is to study whether we can really find a direct signature in the sky of the quantum origin of the perturbation and not an indirect confirmation. So in order to tackle this, uh, this task, uh, I'm, I'm now moving to the second, uh, yes, and I need also to mention that there is an extensive literature on this question, so I'm sorry if I've forgotten uh, uh, an important paper. I'm sure I have forgotten very important papers because the, the list is quite small compared to the I am uh, happy that you have <laughs> quoted me. <laughs> <laughs> the, another, so, so, author, another author is also here. Sir, could you please come and say Jerome to hi? Uh, your microphone is switched off. Your microphone is switched off. Yes. Hi, Jerome. Nice to see you. This is Sudhakar Panda. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Nice to see you. <laughs> we met in HRI. I, I remember. I remember very well. <laughs> hello. <laughs> now I have shifted from Allahabad to Bhubaneswar and Niger as a director. I'm mm -hmm. basically doing some administration. <laughs> okay. So I hope, I hope all is well with you. And thanks yes. for agreeing to give this talk. Oh, but it's a pleasure. Okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Continue. Continue. Uh, yes, so this is a, a subset of, of papers, but I believe all these papers are, are quite uh, uh, important and relevant for, for the subject that I am going to discuss. Uh, so uh, let me start with, uh, so let me now move to the second point, which is a sh very short and brief review of the theory of, of cosmological uh, perturbations. So, to start this section, I just repeat what I, or I have already said, namely, the perturbations originate uh, from the quantum fluctuation of the gravitational and scalar fields. So this means that uh, if we write uh, the metric tensor and, and, uh, and the scalar field, if we assume there is just one scalar field, then it takes the following form. We have first uh, a, a term which only depends on time, and this is supposed to represent the homogeneous and isotropic universe, the friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric and the homogeneous and isotropic scalar field, which is responsible for the inflationary behavior of the background space-time, and plus small fluctuation. So small fluctuation means that we have a perturbative treatment in mind, and you also see that this small fluctuation that depends on space, on X, which means that there are really inhomogeneities on top of a classical background. Uh, so we go beyond the cosmological principle. And in addition, they have a hat on top of it, which means that we assume that they are quantum objects. And uh, as probably you very well uh, know, there are three types of different perturbations, scalar, vector, and tensor. And here, I will concentrate on scalar perturbations. Since you know, they are sorry the... for the interruption once again. Yes. Uh, yes. Since these perturbations are quantum on which we are interested in, but this particular treatment is kind of a semi-classical. Like, like we treat the background to be a classical background and perturbations to be the quantum. Is it so? Uh, yes, it's true. Uh, the only difference I would uh, say, but it's, a, it's, it's not a big one, is when you have a semi-classical treatment in mind, for instance, uh, uh, let's think about the Hawking effect. So uh -huh. you, have, you, have a, you have a scalar field, 
a quantum scalar field which lives in a classical background, which is the, the, the background of a black hole. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, I mean, the, the, the gravitational field in, the, in this situation is uh, completely treated at the classical level. True. Here, here, in the context of cosmology, it's also true uh, at the background level. I mean, the G mu nu of T is the metric tensor of, of a classical background. But you see that part of the perturbations contains uh, also the gravitational field. So in some sense, ah, okay. we also quantize the gravitational field also in a very modest uh, okay. way. Maybe we quantize only very small fluctuation and this is why we escape all this difficult problem of full quantum gravity. Yes. Uh, but, but, but this is the difference, I would say, with a I mean, a strict semi-classical treatment. But if you call semi-classical a, a classical background plus quantum perturbation, then I agree that this is something which is reminiscent of a semi-classical treatment. Yeah, like we really don't know that how to do the path integral over G mu nu. So no. that's the main problem. No, but, but uh, if we treat delta G mu nu yes. as an operator, so it means that in some sense, uh, part of the gravitational field is quantized. Yes. And at the linear level, we know how to do it. We don't know how to do it in, in non-perturbative quantum gravity, but at this, in this perturbative approach, the quantization uh, procedure is, is, is clear and uh, well under control. True. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Uh, so, so yes, so, so there are three types of perturbation and here I will focus only on uh, scalar perturbations because they are the, the, the most important uh, ones. But uh, I mean, uh, the story as far as what I'm going to discuss is concerned would be the same for other types of perturbation, in particular for gravitational wave tensor mode. So um, scalar perturbation, it turns out that scalar perturbation can be described in terms of a single quantity, which is curvature perturbation, which is the, the zeta here that you can see. And this zeta is in this context a quantum operator, so it can be expanded in terms of uh, creation and annihilation operator that are function of time. So if this field, is this scalar field, effective scalar field, uh, which is not to be confused with the inflaton field, of course, if the curvature perturbation field, let's say, uh, uh, would be in Minkowski, then we know the time dependence of the creation and annihilation operator. It would be a simple exponential, exponential i omega t. But of course, this curvature perturbation lives on a slightly more complicated classical background, namely the expanding universe. And therefore, the time dependence of the creation and annihilation operator is different from that of Minkowski and slightly more complicated. Uh, the, this quantity, in addition, this quantity is very relevant, curvature perturbation, because at least on large scale, it is directly related to the temperature anisotropy that we observe uh, in the sky. Uh, Jerome, so one how, question. Yes, yes. So this curvature perturbation is some outcome of the scalar field fluctuation. Now this curvature perturbation, is that a gravitational gauged object? You have chosen some gauge <laughs> to construct the, this curvature perturbation? So, uh, no, it's a, well, uh, so, then when one has to be very careful about what we mean by gauge, but uh, in the language of Bardeen, this curvature yes. perturbation is a gauge invariant object. In fact, okay. uh, um, this gauge, uh, this curvature perturbation is up to a background function, nothing but the Mukhanov-Sasaki variable. Yes. So, so if, you, if you prefer to use this quantity, yes. it's up to a background function, so up to a function of time only, uh, classical function, so not an operator, up to that function, curvature perturbation in this context and mukhanov sasaki variable are exactly the same quantities. Yes. So yes. they are gauge invariant in the bar. And, and you also assume that the anisotropic stress is zero here. Yes, because I have, I have assumed that there is only one scalar field that uh, sources the Einstein equation. 
sure. So sure. I am I am just for the sake of argument, I am I am just considering uh, let's say the vanilla vanilla class of inflationary models where you sure. only have one fee. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay. So yes, I was uh, so I was discussing this time dependence of the creation and annihilation uh, operators. So let's try to uh, see how we can guess this time dependence. And uh, uh, obviously, this can be done once you know the Hamiltonian of the system. So let me show you the Hamiltonian of the system. It's given by this equation. So before I discuss this equation, let me first remark that uh, this Hamiltonian is really derived from first principles. Namely, you take the einstein hilbert action plus the action of a scalar field. You expand everything to second order, second order because you want equation of motion, uh, first order equation of motion. And then you plug the previous expansion in terms of creation and annihilation operators in the corresponding uh, expression and you get the equation that I have written on the slide. So it, it really, there is no extra assumption, it really comes from first principles. Now this Hamiltonian, you see it's made of two pieces. There is the first piece here and you recognize here the free term. It's, a, it's the Hamiltonian of a collection of uh, harmonic oscillators. So there is a collection of harmonic oscillators as revealed by the integral over wave numbers. And this is exactly the Hamiltonian that you would get uh, for, for a free field. Then there is a second term, which is more interesting. And this second term, it represents the interaction between our small fluctuations with the uh, classical background. And this term itself is made of uh, two different uh, pieces. You see that uh, there is uh, first this term, which acts like a time-dependent coupling constant. So in this expression, A is the scale factor. So, so zero, this yes. A square root of epsilon is your Mukhanov's Sasaki variable. No, no, uh, no, no. Uh, so, let, let me explain. A is the scale factor. So it's the, the, the function that describes how the background is expanding. And epsilon one, if this is your question, is the first slow roll parameters. So its definition is minus h dot of h square, where h is the Hubble parameter. But in this context, you can, you can uh, think about this function as just a complicated function of the scale factor and its derivative. Uh, yeah, I know, but the in usual context, this a square root of epsilon is basically the Mukhanov Sasaki variable. No, a square root of epsilon, a square root of epsilon one is a background quantity, so it's not a perturbed ah, okay, quantity, okay. so it cannot be the Mukhanov Sasaki variable. But I think I understand your question. I, I said before that uh, curvature perturbation and Mukhanov Sasaki. Uh, uh, variable were related up to a background function. And you are right yes. that this A square root of epsilon one is exactly the function that relates the curvature perturbation with the mukhanov sasaki variable yeah, up to okay, a Planck okay, mass okay. depending yeah. on which yeah, you yeah. 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 And uh, so this is a time dependent coupling constant, so which means, which has the, the property Sorry, you know, that, uh, yes. The prime denotes time derivative, so the prime denotes the time derivative with respect to conformal time. Yes, yes, conformal time, yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, so, so this effective uh, coupling constant that sits in front of the second term, uh, the important point is that it's, it vanishes if the scale factor derivative is zero. So in other words, if the background space-time is not dynamical, uh, this uh, interaction term does not exist. So in some sense, it really represents the, 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 the interaction uh, between the fluctuation and the background. And uh, so this is for the time-dependent coupling constant, but the, the second piece of the second term 
is also interesting. In particular, you notice this structure k minus k. And in fact, this means that <laughs> Uh, the, the quantas that are associated with curvature perturbation are created uh, by pair with opposite momenta, k minus k. This is the interpretation of, of the term that you see here. So this is how Hamiltonian. And uh, okay, so given that this Hamiltonian is also interesting to compare this inflationary mechanism for the creations of perturbations with what is known in uh, ordinary uh, quantum field theory. Because you could argue, argue that uh, here we are dealing with physics at maybe gut scale 10 to the 15 GV, and therefore that this inflationary mechanism is quite speculative. And I think it's interesting to remark that, uh, in fact, it's exactly the opposite. I would say that this is very conservative, and this is, this is a very conservative mechanism because it belongs to a larger class of effects in the framework of quantum field theory. And in particular, uh, the inflationary, this inflationary mechanism is very similar to the Schwinger effect. So let me remind you about the Schwinger effect. So the Schwinger effect was uh, uh, computed by Schwinger in the 50s, and it consists in the following. You take a field of the electron and positron, so a fermions, which is a quantum field, and this field interacts with a classical source, which is a classical electric field. And because of this interaction between the quantum field and the classical source, you have creation of electrons and positrons. And Schwinger uh, has computed the number of electrons and positrons that you create uh, by this mechanism, and this, he has a well-known equation in, in field theory for, for, for this number. It's, it's, a, it's an effect which is very well-known because we, this is one of the few effects uh, in field theory which is non-perturbative and where you can do the calculation analytically from the very beginning to the very end. And the amplitude of the effect is controlled by the strength of the source, which is in that case the amplitude of the electric field. And for the inflationary cosmological perturbation, it's exactly the same. What plays the role of the quantum field, the electron and positron fields, are the inhomogeneous gravitational and scalar fields. I have forgotten to write the scalar, scalar fields here. So the, the, the curvature perturbation, if you prefer. What plays the role of the classical source is just the classical background, so the scale factor. And it does not come as a surprise if the amplitude of the effect is controlled by the source of the classical source, which is the Hubble parameter. And we know that the two-point correlation function, for instance, of the fluctuation is proportional to h square measured in Planck units. So this is exactly the same effect. So this inflationary mechanism, which may seem at first sight as something quite uh, maybe exotic, is on the contrary something belongs to a class of effects that is really very conservative and very well under control. I have given the example of the Schwinger effect, but I also could cite the dynamical Schwinger effect or even the dynamical Casimir effect, which has been observed in the, in the lab. And the Hawking effect also belongs to this category. So the inflationary mechanism for the perturbation is in fact just one example of a large class of effects in different parts of physics that have been studied and which, uh, I mean, which, which, is, which are very well under control um, and very well understood. Uh, now, let me say a few words about the initial conditions. And you probably have recognized this, uh, this famous plot. So on the vertical axis, you have the uh, physical distances that are relevant for the problem. And uh, on the horizontal axis, this is time. In fact, number of default, that is to say the logarithm of the scale factor. And the colored lines are the uh, Hubble radius, which is constant during inflation. So this is the green part of the line. And the black lines represent the physical wavelength of, uh, of a Fourier mode of astrophysical interest today. So if we follow the history of this mode, we see that initially it was uh, inside the Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation. 
then it crosses out the Hubble radius during inflation, spends some time outside the Hubble radius, and then re-entered the Hubble radius either during radiation or matter or even dark energy epochs, depending on this wave number. And here the important point is that initially the, the, the physical wavelengths of this mode uh, was smaller than the Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation. So this means that in this regime, in fact, the Fourier mode does not feel that it lives in an expanding background. For, for this Fourier mode, everything is similar to Minkowski, which means that uh, we can uh, assume the usual vacuum state, the Minkowski vacuum state in some sense. And this is the assumption that we make in the context of inflation. So we assume initially that the curvature perturbations are placed in the vacuum state that in this context we call the bunch Davis state or the adiabatic state. So, uh, of course, this is the initial state and as inflation, as inflation proceeds, this state will evolve with time. Uh, so it's interesting to describe this uh, uh, ground state or this vacuum state of the perturbation using a different picture. And here I am using the Schrodinger picture. So this means that there is now a wave functional for... Yes, is there a question? Or... No. So there is a wave functional for curvature perturbation. And since I am doing... Uh, uh, linear perturbations, I can always expand or write rather the wave functional as a product of wave function for given mode k. In fact, and this will play a very important role in the following, as the product of wave function for mode k and minus k, so opposite, uh, opposite wave numbers. And if I represent the quantum state of the perturbations, the initial quantum state in the perturbation using this picture, the, I mean, the initial wave function so, uh, is given here. So the zero means at initial time. And it's nothing but a Gaussian state. It's, uh, it's the ground state of an harmonic oscillator, oscillator, if you wish. And in fact, for people who are familiar with quantum optics, is a two-mode vacuum coherent state. So for people working in quantum optics, this state is the prototype of a classical state. So classical light, for instance, in quantum optics is, de is described by a coherent state. So in a, in a phase space picture, a coherent state is a small bump that do not spread and that propagate in phase space following the classical trajectory. So this is something which is in some sense very classical. Uh, here, it's just the ground state of our system. And as I said before, this is for the initial state, but inflation will proceed. The physical wavelengths of the mode under consideration will cross out the Hubble radius and the state will evolve. And you can show that the state will evolve into a two-mode vacuum squeezed state. The two-mode vacuum squeezed state is represented by this wave function. So you see that this is still a Gaussian state, still quadratic in curvature perturbation, but now you have correlation between zeta k and zeta minus k as revealed by the fact that you now have an ellipse here uh, instead of a circle. And in fact, the correlation you see is controlled by this parameter r that I have introduced and r is known, I'm sorry, I'm going in the wrong sense. Uh, R is known as the squeezing parameter. So it's a function of time, which depends the details, I mean, the detailed behavior of which with respect to time depends on the, uh, on the detailed behavior of the background. But during inflation, whatever the, the potential of the uh, inflaton field, if we have inflation, the squeezing parameter is increasing with time. So this means that this ellipse becomes flatter, flatter as inflation pro, uh, proceeds. So uh, uh, a question is how much squeezed is the cosmological two-mode squeezed state? And here I have a small uh, analogy to offer. Uh, the small analogy is the following one. You probably know 
that uh, at the background level, uh, CMB is, uh, I mean, the CMB radiation is a black body. And in fact, it's known that this is the most accurate black body ever produced in nature. So if you go to the lab and try to design something, an oven or something like that, uh, in order to uh, uh, produce a black body radiation, you will never be able to obtain a spectrum as accurate as the one we observe in the sky. So you see this curve here, the black, the, I'm sorry, the red dots are the measurement performed by the Kobe satellite. The green line is the theoretical black yeah, body spectrum. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interpret. Can you, can you please go back to the previous slide? Yes. Where you introduce this uh, squeeze parameter. Yes. You put it by hand or how did they appear in this web functional? No, no. So I have skipped a lot of details, but I have not introduced it by hand. In fact, it's when you solve the equation of motion, so using the Hamiltonian that I have shown before, that you end yeah. up with this solution. So this is a solution of the Schrodinger equation for the wave functional of the perturbations. Neither the wave functional had the R dependence, nor the Hamiltonian had the R dependence. How did the solution suddenly depend on the dependence on R? So R is just a function of time that I can explicitly express Okay, using, whatever you get. Uh, okay. the scale factor. So R, R, if you wish, you can express it in terms of the scale factor. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, so uh, I was talking about this uh, black body radiation. So you see the theoretical curve, this is the green line. The, the uh, red dots are the measurements performed by the Kobe satellite. And in fact, the error bars have been magnified by a factor of 400. Otherwise, you would not be able to see the error bars because they would be smaller than the uh, thickness of the line. So this really tells you that the CMB, uh, the cosmological uh, black body, is really the most accurate black body ever produced in nature. And by analogy, in fact, the same is true at the perturbative level in some sense because the value the typical value of the squeezing parameter that we have at the end of inflation is of the order of 10 to the 2, it's maybe slightly less than this. And it's a huge value compared to what people are able to achieve in the lab. So in the lab, people are fighting to achieve R of order of few, while in cosmology, uh, we are able, well, uh, the universe is doing for us, uh, can, can achieve values up to, uh, uh, it depends on the detail, of course, but of the order of 10 to the 2. So probably the, 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 the perturbation are placed, the cosmological perturbation are placed in the strongest squeezed state ever produced in nature, which is an interesting Sorry, you know, again. No, sorry yeah, no, 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 no problem. So this RK order of 100, this you estimated by fitting with this CMB uh, spectrum as well as the anisotropic, anisotropic spectrum? Uh, well, uh, yes and no. In fact, what you do, you can, uh, if you specify a potential, yeah. uh, you can solve for the background dynamics yes. and therefore you can solve for R of T and compute its value at the end of inflation. And yes. of course, if you now, of course, you need something, something, uh, something else which, uh, which fits your question. Namely, you, you need to fix the free parameters of the model such yeah. that it fits the, CM, the, the measurement of the CMB and is okay. okay. so and that's if, what you do, if you do all that, yeah. you obtain a value of R which is of that order. Of course, you would okay. get different values depending, uh, considering different potentials, but the order yeah. of magnitude is always the same. Yeah. Okay. But till now, we have not defined actually a given potential. Unless the order, no, no, potential. Yeah, the order of, uh, so I did not get the question very clearly, but the order of magnitude did not, does not depend on the, on the particular shape of the potential. The precise okay. value, of course, does depend on, this, on, okay. on the choice of the potential. Right. Um, yes. Um, yeah, so it's in, uh, a fact that I find uh, quite interesting that cosmology is giving us the strongest squeezed state ever observed in nature in some sense. 
So this concludes this uh, brief uh, reminder of the theory of cosmological perturbations. And now, namely, uh, let me uh, come to the third section of the talk, namely, let me uh, address the question of whether the perturbations are quantum or whether they can, at the effective level, be described in classical or stochastic terms. And here it starts to be uh, quite interesting because uh, at first sight, at least at first sight, uh, uh, I can find arguments in favor of a quantum or a classical description. I, I can find arguments in favor of a quantum description, but at the same time, I can find arguments in favor of a classical description as well. So uh, let me first go through almost all of them and explain what are these arguments. And, um, and, and, and let's see uh, at the end whether they are in contradiction with each other or not. So let's start with the, the first, so let's start with the uh, arguments in favor of a, of a quantum system. And the first one is the fact that uh, a two mode squeezed state is an entangled state. And he, for that, I just remind you this slide that I showed a couple of minutes ago, where at the bottom of the potential, you can see the wave function of uh, curvature perturbation here. This is the equation that we discussed before. And the interesting point here is that this wave function for the Fourier mode zeta k and zeta minus k cannot be written as the product of a wave function for the mode zeta k times a wave function for the mode zeta minus k, which means that a two mode squeezed state is an entangled state. And an entangled state, as you uh, very well know, is considered as the prototype of uh, a state which cannot be described in classical terms. So based on this argument, we would immediately conclude that the system cannot be described uh, by classical physics. And in addition, there is another argument, which is that uh, if you send the squeezing parameter to infinity, if you take this formal limit, then the two mode squeezed state goes to exactly an Einstein Podolsky Rosen state, which is, again, as you know, the, the state that is usually used, was used by Einstein and many people after him to discuss the weird property of quantum mechanics. So from this argument, we would conclude that the perturbations are certainly a very quantum with quotation mark system. Another argument is that the quantum discord of the system is, is, is large. Uh, here I just mention it uh, very briefly because this was, uh, this was uh, treated in details by Vincent Venin in his talk. So uh, if you want more details, you can look at, you can watch this, this talk online. But very briefly, I just repeat the main argument. So the quantum discord is a tool that was designed in quantum information theory. And basically the idea is the following. Uh, you want to know if a system is quantum or classical. So in order to decide, what you do is that you split the system into, sub, to, into two subsystems and you study the correlation between these two subsystems. So if the correlation is classical, the quantum discord uh, is zero. And if you have some degree of quantumness in the correlation between the two subsystems, the quantum discord is non-vanishing. And here, what we have done with Vincent is to calculate the quantum discord for a two-mode squeezed state as a function of the squeezing parameter. And the, the answer is represented by the blue line. So you see that when the squeezing parameter is zero, the discord is zero, which means that uh, the system is classical. And it makes perfect sense because if the squeezing parameter is zero, the two mode squeeze state is in fact a coherent state as we saw before. And as I said before, a coherent state is exactly the quantum state that is used by people in quantum optics to describe classical light. So it makes perfect sense 
that for vanishing uh, squeezing parameter, the discord is zero. But as soon as R is not zero, the discord is growing. And in fact, for large values of R, the discord is just proportional to the squeezing parameter. So since the squeezing is very strong in cosmology, this means that the quantum discord is very large. And therefore, this, according to this criterion, this signals the fact that the system is in fact very quantum. And this confirms the first uh, argument. So based on these two arguments, it seems unavoidable to conclude that the system is a very quantum system. So we, the, 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 puzzling and, uh, the puzzling aspect of the problem is that I can now uh, uh, come with uh, arguments that put so, you know, into... I have one question. Yes. Uh, the idea of Discord actually uh, take care of the mutual information also. So where is actually taken care of this? Uh... So Discord, part of the Discord is exactly the mutual information. So this is the mutual information between subsystem K and subsystem minus K. So it's the fact that you have this quantum correlation that I showed before, you know, the ellipse, mm -hmm. uh, which is responsible for this uh, non-vanishing uh, uh, mutual information. Yes. And, and, and non-vanishing discord, therefore. Okay. Yes, so as I was saying, there are also arguments that point to a completely different conclusion. So let me now uh, go through these uh, arguments in some details. So these arguments, in, in, uh, in, in uh, contrast to what I have just discussed, seem to suggest that the system can be described in classical terms. So the first argument is that a stochastic description of the perturbation is possible because the Wigner function of the system is positive definite. So let me explain and spend some time on these words and explain uh, what I mean by that. So uh, the, the idea uh, to start the discussion is to study under which condition a quantum system can be described uh, by a stochastic consideration. So to answer this question, let's consider a function A that lives in phase space. So here I take as an example, the discussion could be, uh, uh, could be done in any phase space, but let me consider a four dimensional phase space for obvious reasons. It's because I have mod K and minus K. So this means two directions, K, QK and Q minus K are the, if you wish, the position associated with mod k and minus k. And we have the two corresponding conjugate momenta, pi k and pi minus k. So this means that we deal with a four-dimensional phase space. Uh, and we consider a function, any function, that lives in this phase space. So what are the conditions under which a classical, or rather a stochastic description of a quantum system, of a, of a quantum system can be performed. Well, first, we would like any quantum average of any operators or any functions uh, to be equal or to be, uh, to be uh, equal, yes, to a stochastic average. The stochastic average uh, being defined by this expression, namely the, the, the standard expression, an integral of this function in phase space, uh, of this function A of R in phase space, with a distribution W of R, which is a probability density function. So this is the classical expression for a stochastic average. And if stochastic average and quantum average coincide, then I may say that I have a stochastic description of the system. Of course, I have also other considerations because this probability density function, W of R, should be positive definite. 
because a, a, a distribution, a classical distribution is positive definite. And W should also obey the classical equation of motion. So if I have these three conditions, then in some sense, the system which is uh, at a deep level, a quantum one, can at the effective, effectively can be described in terms of uh, stochastic uh, computations. And I may argue that a kind of uh, quantum to classical transition has taken place. So under which condition are these three rules satisfied? This is what we are going to discuss now. Uh, so, uh, in order to discuss this, it's interesting to introduce the Vi transform. So, what is the Vi transform? It's a map that takes an operator and returns a function in phase space according to the equation that I have written on the slide. So, you see, basically, the Vi transform of the operator A is the Fourier transform of its mean value, if you wish. So the Weyl transform of the operator A will be noted TW of A, and it's a function of R because it's a function in phase space. Uh, so, uh, okay, it's a definition and you can take some uh, examples and see what it gives. So this is what I have done here. So uh, RG and RK are just the component of the vector R. So for instance, R1 is just Q of K. And uh, if you compute the Weyl transform of the operators RG, RK, it gives this. So for instance, if you take Q of K squared, operator Q of K squared, its Weyl transform is exactly the same function, Q of K squared. But if you compute the Weyl transform of QK times pi K, it gives the function QK times pi K, pi K plus an additional contribution, which is this I over two uh, and the matrix element of the, of the matrix J here. And of course, uh, this term is present because QK and pi K are operators that do not commute. Another oh, yes. confusion I have. Uh, in the right hand side of this formula, where you have introduced q k and q minus k with x and y, are you treating the q k and q minus k are operators? Here you mean in the ket? Yeah. No, yeah. they are the they are the so q k is the eigenvector of the operator q k. So q. So this uh, is a right hand side is a classical average. Uh, sorry, uh, you mean uh, here? No, no, this part. No. Uh, this part? Are, uh, yeah, and they are, if Q are not operators, this is a no. classical average you are talking of, of A? No, no, A is a quantum operator. So, the thing is, suddenly my computer uh, crashed. So, ah. can, can you go back a little bit earlier? Yes. Because it is recording. Yes, where? Uh, yeah, yeah, from this slide. Can you uh, tell from this? You mean from the first point? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry for this because suddenly it crashed. No problem. Uh, yes. So what I was trying to say is that uh, so in this expression, so we now, we now have, in some sense, a candidate for the distribution, which would be the Wigner function, and that this condition is always true if the Weyl transform of the operator is the corresponding function in phase space. And this is true for any power of curvature perturbation. The Weyl transform of any power of curvature perturbation operator is always equal to the function curvature perturbation to power n. So you know, equal, yes. Uh, this statement which we checked that this is matching, the stochastic description is matching with the, the way we treated the quantum system and with all the conditions satisfied. Has anyone checked instead of linear perturbation, if I would have kept next order in perturbation, this would have been still true? 
So I did not get your question completely, but the, I heard linear perturbation. So yeah. it, uh, yes, we, we, it, we did the curvature perturbation, keeping only the linear perturbations of the scalar field and the metric field. Suppose I would have kept one order higher. Do you think that this matching still we could have demonstrated? <laughs> or it, it may be true in the linear level of perturbation, but may not be true in the next order. So. Uh, I believe that this property that any power of curvature perturbation satisfy this equation would always be true. But where you are right is that if I go to the next order in perturbation theory, That's there right. is no reason for the state to remain a Gaussian. In fact, I am absolutely sure of the opposite. The quantum state will no longer be a Gaussian. That's and right. in that case, the Wigner function will no longer be positive definite. Okay. So this okay. equation will still be valid, but at the price of having a, a probability density function, which is sometimes negative, which is yeah, uh, physically uh, uh, meaningless. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So. Yes, so, so uh, the Wigner function, so at least at linear level, the Wigner function is positive definite, and the W uh, uh, obeys the classical equation of motion, and this is uh, this is also true for cosmological perturbation. But in fact, again, this has nothing. Uh, this is nothing specific to cosmological perturbation. In fact, this is true for any quadratic Hamilton. But in any case. In the case of cosmological perturbation, these three conditions are satisfied, which means uh, that any quantity that we observe in the sky, such as the power spectrum or the bi spectrum or the tri spectrum, uh, which are all, in fact, power of curvature perturbation, they can all be reproduced uh, by means of stochastic averages. And this is a property which has nothing to do with the amount of squeezing in the system. So in, in this sense, you don't need a, a quantum mechanics to calculate the statistical properties of the, of the CMB, if you wish. And so you could argue that since your system can be completely described in terms of a stochastic process, it's a classical system. So this is, a, I just skip this because I see that my time is, uh, is running fast. Uh, so this is the first argument. Now let's go through a second argument, which is an argument based on the WKB approximation. So uh, <clears throat> instead of considering uh, the perturbation, let me try to simplify the problem and consider the inverted harmonic oscillator for reasons that hopefully will become clear in the following minutes. So I take the in one dimensional uh, inverted harmonic oscillator, the Lagrangian of which is given by this. And you see that there is the wrong sign in, in front of the potential. So the potential is minus Q squared, if you wish. Uh, and you, so the potential looks like that. It's an inverse parabola, if you wish. And if you assume that you start at the top of the potential in the vacuum state, you can, I mean, you can derive the Hamiltonian of the system and solve the Schrodinger equation. And you end up with the conclusion that the quantum state of your system is a squeezed state. So this is here that we have uh, the connection with the cosmological perturbations. And in fact, the time dependence of the, the squeezing parameter R is just linear in time. So if you wait a very long time, your quantum state will be a strongly squeezed state, exactly as for the perturbation. So this is a system which in some sense mimics uh, the system of the cosmological perturbations. Now you can also, you see that this state can be written in polar form, which is very reminiscent of the WKB approximation. So here C is the overall amplitude and here, you have, in some sense, the definition of the action or the, the classical phase of the, of the state. And 
you can now write the condition, the well-known condition for the validity of the WKB regime, which is expressed in terms of C and S. And you, so the validity of uh, the WKB regime means that this quantity should be very large compared to one. And since this quantity is the uh, sign of the squeezing parameter and the squeezing parameter is large, it means that your quantum uh, state is in fact very well or satisfies very well the WKB approximation. So in some sense, you could argue, uh, this is very often what people have in mind, that WKB means classical. And in this sense, the system is classical, at least satisfy WKB. So is it true that WKB means classical? So uh, it's interesting first to remark that it's a long standing question. If you study this question, you find many papers on that question. And uh, very often that papers uh, have different conclusions. And in fact, in the con yes. You know, yes. Uh, you took a, an example which is even classically unstable. Could, yes, I, okay. could have I got the same information that WKB is classical? If I would have, instead of an inverted harmonic oscillator, I would have considered simple harmonic oscillator instead of the wrong sign would have the correct sign. Can we make the statement that still WKB is classical? Uh, <coughs> No, for, uh, uh, well, I have not studied the case for an ordinary harmonic oscillator, but I don't think so, because uh, in any case, it would yeah. not be a squeezed state in that yeah. case. We know that it would not be a squeezed state. It not be a squeezed state, but I'm not you taking a wrong example, which is classically unstable, and then making some conclusion like WKB is a classical thing. Uh, it gives me a bit... Uh, thought to think in my mind that maybe something we are not in the right track. No, because, uh, you know, uh, of course, I, I mean, if I want to treat completely the problem, of course, at some point I would have to add uh, some higher terms here with, yeah. with the correct sign in order to stabilize the system. But this would not change the fact that in this regime, Mm -hmm. the, the state is a strongly squeezed state, then it will, uh, of course, the, 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 the evolution of the system would be drastically affected by the higher order terms at some point. But yeah. in this regime, here I'm just considering this regime, and within, here it's true that, yes. Within this regime, it looks like WKB is classical, but we don't know what happens if we add extra terms. Okay, okay, I understand. Okay. Yes, but I have not finished the discussion on uh, <laughs> on WKB is classical because it's okay. it's more it's it's more subtle than than this. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So in the context of cosmology, in fact, it was first addressed by uh, people working in quantum cosmology in the 80s and 90s because you know in quantum cosmology we have the Wheeler-DeWitt equation and it's difficult to interpret this Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Uh, because it's like uh, a Klein-Gordon equation, so you are driven to the problem that there are negative probabilities and so on. And so usually people uh, had the habit to use the uh, Wheeler-DeWitt equation only in the WKB regime. And these people were arguing that in the WKB regime, uh, th this is precisely the regime uh, in which the universe, the wave function of the universe becomes classical. And uh, it's interesting to really study this argument in more detail. So here I have summarized the, the argument. So the idea was to solve the wheeler devitt equation in the WKB regime. So we have a WKB wave function of the universe. Uh, and uh, and this is here that we have a connection with the previous considerations. The idea of those people was to compute the Wigner function of the WKB wave function. So it's a simple calculation. Here I am just considering the, uh, the one dim dimensional case. So you just insert the definition of the WKB wave function 
the expression, I'm sorry, of the WKB uh, wave function into the definition of the Wigner function. So you obtain this equation and then you expand everything in H bar. So you see that the overall amplitude C square can go outside the integral and then you obtain the integral of some ex complex exponential. This gives a delta function and you get this expression. So you get a Wigner function, which is positive definite and which, is, which exactly follow the classical trajectories in phase space because P is equal to ds over dq is exactly the classical trajectory. And moreover, this uh, Wigner function is weighted by the amplitude of the wave function. And so uh, uh, in, in the 80s and 90s, people concluded in the context of quantum cosmology that indeed um, uh, a classical uh, or WKB wave function means uh, that the system is classical. And the interesting point is that, uh, in fact, this calculation, it was realized soon after the publication of those papers that this conclusion is wrong. And in fact, the WKB Wigner function was calculated, in fact, 10 years before by Berry. And uh, the calculation of the Wigner, the correct calculation of the Wigner function is this one. So I'm not going to explain the meaning of all the symbols, the, the really the bottom line here here, AI means just airy function. So it's a function which oscillates. And so the, the bottom line here is that it's not positive definite and it does not follow the classical trajectories. And so this calculation, which consists in expanding in edge bar is in fact not valid. So it seems that you cannot conclude that WKB means classical based on this calculation. But in fact, the story is even more complicated than that because there is one case where the calculation which is wrong in general is correct. This is the case where the phase of the wave function is quadratic because what the, the error in the calculation that I have shown is due to the fact that the expansion in H bar is not consistent with the fact that you integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. But there is one case where it is true. It's when the action is where the action or the phase of the wave function is quadratic. And this is exactly the case for cosmological perturbation. Because we have seen that uh, this is a quadratic system and therefore the action is quadratic. This is the equation that we have established before. So it turns out that in the specific case of the cosmological perturbation, the calculation that was wrong in general turns out to be correct. And therefore, based on, on this argument, you could indeed argue that uh, WKB means classical and therefore that the perturbations are, uh, are, are classical. So, where do we stand now? Let me recap. So, According to the first uh, category of arguments, a two-mode squeezed state uh, as a positive Wigner function, it satisfies WKB, and hence there is no need of quantum mechanics to calculate the statistical properties of the perturbations. Everything can be described in terms of classical terms. According to the uh, quantum argument, on the contrary, the system is placed in an almost EPR Schrodinger state, which is known on the contrary to be the prototypical non-classical state. So how can these two statements be true at the same time? This is the question. And uh, the funny uh, fact is that in fact, exactly the same situation and the same question was discussed by John Bell long time ago, of course, in a context that has nothing to do with, con with cosmology, because John Bell was not aware of this. And in, in fact, at the time at which John Bell published his paper, all these uh, uh, theoretical considerations were not fully developed. But John Bell asked exactly the same question in the different contexts. And in fact, uh, 
uh, it is discussed in detail in this famous book, Speakable and Unspeakable in Quantum Mechanics. And in fact, this is, in f this is the chapter 21. The chapter 21 is entitled EPR Correlations and EPW Distribution. EPW stands for Eugène Paul Wigner, and the chapter 21 is dedicated to Wigner. And of course, EPW distribution means in our language, the Wigner function. And so uh, I'm going to explain uh, what was the question asked by John Bell. And by the way, I, I, I would like to know how am I doing with time? How much time do I have? You, you have uh, more time because suddenly for 15 min uh, 10 minutes it was uh, uh, so you can continue you have more time <laughs> okay you can stop me if i if, yeah, I, if yeah, it's yeah, too yeah. long so there is no upper bound it is upon me okay we will not stop you just go ahead okay okay perfect so i go ahead so the statement of john bell was the following, the one he was trying to defend in his paper. The statement of John Bell was, if a state has a positive definite Wigner function, then Bell's inequality, its own inequality, cannot be violated. And in order to reach this conclusion, Bell, in his paper, uh, considers the following situation. So let's assume that we have two spinless particles. So it's important to uh, notice that the, the two particles, so they are non-relativistic particles, ordinary particles, but they don't have any spin. So it's different from the usual formulation of the Bell inequality, where you have a source and you have two particles with spin that move away from each other. And then at Alice and Bob location, you measure the spin of the particles. Here, maybe it, it looks a bit like that, but it's, it's in fact very different. First difference is that the two spin the two particles have no spin. And they move along one axis, the red axis on this, on this figure. But they can move in any direction. They are, not, they are not necessarily moving in opposite directions. They just move along the red axis. And we assume, or John Bell assumes, that we can measure only position. Uh, the position of particle one and the position of particle two. Now, Bell, he wants to formulate uh, its own inequality, but in the CHSH form, which means he wants to formulate uh, his, his, his inequality in terms of dichotomic variable, as in the traditional presentation of the Bell inequality. So with variable that uh, can take value uh, plus or minus one. But here we have access only to the measurement of the position of particle one and particle two. And the position operator has a continuous spectrum. It does not have a discrete spectrum. It does not have plus and minus one uh, as a spectrum, as eigenvalue. So uh, in order to define dichotomic variable, Bell introduces a trick. He introduces pseudo spins operators, or fictitious spin operators, S1 and S2, I'm going to explain what they are. But here I stress again that they are fictitious spin operators. The particle, the physical particles, they are spinless particles. And the, the, the fictitious spin operators are defined in this way. So let's take the, the spin, the fictitious spin of particle one. Uh, so the idea is that you just measure the position of the particle one plus some Q0 over two. So Q0 is just some arbitrary coordinate uh, on, on the axis, but you can, it's a detail, you can forget about it because since it's, it, it is arbitrary, in fact, at the end, when you, when you calculate observable quantities, it disappears from the results. Uh, and you, you, so you measure the position and uh, you just, uh, uh, register the sign of this quantity. If the sign is positive, the fictitious spin operator has value plus one. If it's negative, uh, the fictitious spin operator has value minus one. So from an operator which has a continuous spectrum, the position operator of the particle one, 
you define an operator which has a, a, a discrete spectrum plus or minus one. And you measure the spin operator at time T1. So T1, it plays the role, so the time at which you measure the spin operator, it plays the role of the polarimeter setting in the usual formulation of the Bell inequality. And you do the same for the second spin operator, the spin operator of the second particle. So now you have two spin operators and you can uh, carry out the usual discussion of the Bell inequality. Namely, you define the Bell operator according to this equation where E is the mean value of the spin operator of particle one. I could say the particle of Alice and the, and of the, of the spin operator of the particle two, I could say the particle of Bob, plays in a given state. And this is the usual stuff. Classically, B should be less than two, but quantum mechanically, you know that B has to be less than only two square root of two. This is the Shirelson bound. And therefore, if you find a, config a configuration where the mean value of B is larger than two, but of course smaller than two square root of two, you say that the system is necessarily quantum because this is a situation that you cannot reproduce using classical physics. So this is the setup that John Bell studies in his paper. And then he proceeds and what he does, first he calculates the Bell operator for a state that has a positive Wigner function. And he finds that B, the Bell operator, is necessarily smaller than two. And then he does another calculation, he calculates B for a state that has a negative Wigner function. And he finds that B can be larger than two. And therefore he concludes that a positive Wigner function means that the system is classical in the sense that if the Wigner function is positive definite, then you cannot violate Bell's inequality. Uh, so it's very interesting and very relevant for our case because we are precisely in the case, in the, in the context of cosmology, where the Wigner function is positive definite. So does that mean that we cannot violate Bell inequality? According to John Bell, indeed, it should, it should not be possible. The point is that after its publication, uh, the Bell's paper has been criticized by a series of other articles. So this question has attracted a, quite a lot of attention and there was a controversy about this, this question. And in fact, uh, so it's an interesting uh, part of, uh, of history and I have told this history in details in, in a recent paper that I have put on the web uh, last year. Uh, and in this paper, in fact, I show that the Bell's paper is wrong, is incorrect. And the paper, the, the funny thing is that the, the, the articles criticizing Bell's paper are wrong as well. This is really a fascinating story that I have followed in details in that paper, if you are interested in this story. Uh, really, it's a funny one. Uh, you, can, you can read this paper. And in fact, the, the situation uh, was in fact completely clari clarified only quite recently, finally, in 2004-2006 by Revzen. And what Revzen has shown is that it's true that the system is classical, is the Wigner function is positive definite, except for a subset of very specific operators. And so, in fact, even if the Wigner function is positive definite, as it is the case in cosmology, there still exists a class of operators that can lead to non-classical properties. And by non-classical properties, I mean properties that cannot be understood in terms of st a stochastic calculation or that can violate the Bell inequality. So obviously, these operators are more complicated than simple powers of curvature perturbation. For simple power of curvature perturbation, it's true that anything can be done using stochastic calculations. But for the specific classes of operators, and of course, 
simple power of curvature perturbation do not belong to this class of more complicated operators. For, but for these classes of more complicated operators, the quantum nature of the perturbation is still present. So this means that this Don't is what I have said. Yes. Is the first statement true even if we are dealing at the quadratic level? Can you repeat the question? I missed the beginning. Yeah, I'm just asking the statement, the first statement you made. Even if W greater than zero, there exist classes of operators that can lead to non-classical properties. Is this statement true even at the quadratic level? Yes, Which... it's, yes, yes. I will show you an example. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, um, yes, yeah, so this means that so, so this means that the contradiction that I was discussing before is in fact not a contradiction. You can very well have positive Wigner function and a classical description in terms of stochastic distribution for some quantities. And at the same time, other classes of operators that still contain a quantum signature of the origin of the perturbations. Uh, of course, uh, if we could observe these operators, uh, this would be very important because this could lead to a signature of the quantum origin of the perturbation, which I recall was our main goal. Is there a direct signature of the quantum origin of the perturbation? So is there an example, an example of, of such an operator? And uh, yes, there is, and let me discuss, uh, let me discuss an example. So let's assume that uh, you are given uh, uh, the Planck map that you observe with the Planck satellite. So you, you are given a map. So this means that you have the Zaxfall effect. You know delta t over t everywhere in the sky. From this knowledge, through this uh, Zaxfall equation, you can extract the value of curvature perturbation for any uh, wave number. And from curvature perturbation, you can calculate the value of this uh, position operator that I was discussing before for the mod k. This, this operator is a Hermitian operator and therefore it's a, good it's a good candidate for an observable. So from the map, in principle at least, from the measurement of the map, I can infer the value of the Fourier modes of this operator q. Uh, but this value of uh, this operator Q has, of course, a continuous spectrum. Uh, while we would like to discuss uh, whether we can uh, violate uh, the Bell inequality in terms of a dichotomic variable. But now we know how to tackle this problem. We just do exactly as John Bell did. So how can we proceed? Well, very simple. We take the real line, which represents the spectrum of the position operator, and we divide, we split the real axis. I missed one thing. In your previous slide, yes. you define this operator, QK, at the new parameter yes. we have introduced, Z or G, whatever you say. Ah, I'm sorry, Z, uh, it's not a new parameter. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have defined Z, yes. It's just a function. Uh, we were discussing at the very beginning. It's uh, the scale factor times square root of epsilon once. It's just a background function, so it plays no role. But between these two terms, I have, I have difficulty. Somehow they don't uh, dimensional, not correct. The second term has a one by energy term, and the first term does not have that. So what's going on? Uh, I think, uh, no, no, but because here there is K, which has the... Yeah, that's so the analysis. K is the wave number, so zeta is like uh, zeta over eta. So it's like having zeta but over k eta, and k eta is dimensionless. So this quantity has the same dimension as zeta k. So the dimension is correct. Sorry, zeta and zeta diagonal has different dimension? So, uh, sorry. No, the point, the zeta point prime is basically... Uh, zeta prime is basically zeta, zeta over eta. Okay, sorry, sorry. I didn't under, I didn't notice the prime. Yeah. Okay. 
Yes, yes. Oh, Prime is the, the, deriv the derivative with conformal time. So the dimensions are correct, I think. Yes. Oh. Uh, so yes, so you divide the uh, you divide the line you split the line into an infinite number of intervals. L is the width of uh, given intervals, and and each interval has a label. So for instance, this interval here has the label five. The, the one after has label six, and uh, the size of the cell. So L, little L, the size of the cell is completely arbitrary. You choose the size of, of the cell. And once you have done this, what you do is that you perform a measurement of the observable K, Q of K. So you observe, uh, so, so this means that you perform the observation and therefore Q of K has a given value. And let's assume that Q of K lands in this interval. Then you add, you give, uh, you define a quantity, uh, which I call S because for obvious reason, because this is a spin, which is defined by minus one to the power N, where N is the label of the interval in which the system has landed. So here it's five, so minus one to the power five, it's minus one. So you say that this, with this procedure, you have measured the pseudo so spin zero? to be minus one. Yes. Is it, is it kind of a parity type of thing here? Uh, so if you take L to be very big, this would lead exactly to that. Yes. Ah, okay. Exactly. But uh, yes, exactly. And you see, of course, uh, the analogy is striking. It's exactly the same trick as introduced by John Bell in his paper. It's exactly the same logic. So in fact, this procedure that I have just described for you, it's equivalent to defining the following spin operator. Oh, you sorry, can... one, yes. one more here. No. Oh, it looks like n is the number of intervals we have defined, right? N goes, yes, N goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Yes, N is an integral. Yes. The number of intervals we are talking about. So the number of interval is infinite because the line is infinite. Or then what happens in the N going to infinite limit? What but happens? N is a finite number. Sorry, the quality of the sound is not very good and I cannot get the question. What happens in which limit? No. How do I know that n is a definite number? n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, but in both the limits, uh, it's basically, I say, it does not give me any more sign of the spin operator. They coincide to the same thing. But I'm, I'm failing to understand. See, what I'm saying is that between L, the L you have divided going from NL to N plus one L, so an extra L uh, type. Yeah, here. So what, what exactly N means here? So typically what this N, N means? N can be anything, okay? So. N, N is an integer, so I yeah. just... For large, I, I, for large N, NL and N plus one, L will be same. So the, that's the continuum limit. I mean, the size of the... I, I'm not sure I understand your question, but the size of the interval is always the same, if this is the question. It's always L, even if N is very big. Even if N is for very big, uh, can we distinguish NL and N plus one L? So NL plus one L minus NL is always L. Um, okay, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. I, I, I'll find it. Yeah, okay. Go yes. So th this 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 thing that I have described just for you is in fact equivalent to defining these operators. 
And you can check that this is a spin because if I take the square of it, it would give this. And you see that this scalar product between the bra Q, QK and the ket Q bar K is non-zero only if the intervals N and M are the same. So if N is equal to M. But if N is equal to M, this gives this equation, minus one to the power two N is one. So basically this ends up summing all the projectors along all the lines. And of course, this gives an, an operator which tells you whether the particle is somewhere in the line. And since the particle is always somewhere along the line, this gives one, and therefore, this is S a spin operator. S is like a projection operator. Yes, exactly. This, this gives the projector, exactly. This, this gives the, this is the projector operator. So this is the projector, in some sense, this is the projector operator in each cell weighted by minus or plus. Okay, okay. Exactly. So this is a situation where the spin operator plays the role of the project projection operator. Yeah, that's a good thing, yeah. Yeah. yeah good. So this, this defines the Z component of the spin operator. And it's a technical detail, but you can also define the later operator, S plus, and from that, using the usual uh, definition, you can introduce the spin along, uh, fictitious spin, of course, along the X component and, uh, or the X component of the spin operator, I'm sorry, and the Y component of the spin operator. So by this trick following John Bell inside, we have, we can now define a complete set of pseudo spin operators and you can check that they verify the SU2 commutation relationships. And then, <coughs> you can again carry out the same thing as before, namely you define the quantum average of the product of two spin operators, one for the mode K, the other for the mode minus K, and you compute this uh, average in a two mode squeeze up state, since this is the quantum state of the perturbation. And then you construct the Bell operator and you check whether this can be larger than two or not. And this is the calculation that we have done with Vincent Venin. And in brief, the conclusion is that indeed it can be larger than two. So this is here a concrete example of a system which has a positive definite Wigner function, which satisfy the WKB limit, but which for which it's still possible to find operators. So these more complicated operators I was mentioning before, one I mean, one specific example are these pseudo spin operators. So th for these more complicated operators, you can violate the Bell inequality. Even, I repeat, if the, if the, 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 the Wigner function is positive definite, and even if the WKB limit is satisfied. So this is a concrete example of such a system. So this shows that the classical limit is, is very subtle in quantum mechanics. So this is what I have just said. So now I, I am moving towards the end. So I hope now it's clear that even if uh, we have a system which has a positive Wigner function and therefore uh, which allows for a stochastic description for a given class of observables, there are other classes of observables of operators for which we can hope to find a direct signature of the quantumness of the perturbation. And that there, are no there is no contradiction between these two things at all. So I have identified concretely those spins operators based on John Bell uh, paper. So can I really use these more complicated classes, class of operators to find a direct signature of the quantumness of the perturbation? This is the question that I would like to address to finish the talk. So the first remark is that to perform this uh, Bell experiment in the sky, I need to measure at least two pseudo spin components. So this means that I need to measure two 
non-commuting operators. If I measure only the, let's say, the Z component of the, of the spin uh, operator, I cannot uh, define the Bell operator and I cannot perform the Bell experiment. So in terms of curvature perturbations, uh, this means that I have to measure, uh, the, I mean, since the pseudo spin operators are defined in terms of the curvature perturbation, this means that I have to measure uh, exactly in the same way two non commuting uh, op operators. So the curvature perturbation itself, zeta of k, and the momentum, pi of k, since they do not commute. But the momentum is basically. Uh, the derivative of zeta of k. So if I want to concretely uh, replicate in the sky this Bell experiment, I need to measure at the same time the curvature perturbation, but also its derivative. And how can I have access to this derivative? Well, you remember I had this definition for the curvature uh, uh, perturbation operator, and it's its evolution was controlled by this Hamiltonian that I discussed at the very beginning of the talk. So from this Hamiltonian, I can find the equation of motion uh, of the mode function, zeta of k, and it obeys this equation, which is the equation of a parametric oscillator. And the solution of which is given by this. So it's made of two pieces, a growing and a decaying mode, as it is well known in cosmology. And the growing mode is in fact a constant, and the decaying mode goes as the inverse of the cube of the scale factor. And this is very unfortunate because this means that the decaying, the, this means that the derivative is in fact zero, or is not zero, but it's very small because the derivative of the growing mode is zero, so it remains uh, the decaying mode, and the decaying mode, you see, it's in a universe which is exponentially growing, it's exponentially killed. So this means that also this signature is present in principle in the sky. Measuring uh, this signature requires the measurement of the decaying mode, so the derivative of the curvature perturbation, which is, I believe, impossible in practice and forever because it's so tiny. It's exponentially killed. So, the conclusion is a bit frustrating, I should uh, admit. The, I mean, we have understood that also the system possesses some classical properties. It still contains a quantum signature of its origin. It's there in principle, but in practice, in the context of cosmology, I believe that it will never be possible to measure it. So, is there a way out? Well, if you want to... I'm sorry to disturb you. No, no, uh, you don't disturb me. <laughs> in this part, exactly what you have shown, I'm very happy about that. There is a growing more, there is a growing up operator, and there is a decaying operator. I don't know classically, there is any system, classical physics can explain decay. Uh, Again, the, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, it, the, the, the sound is broken sometimes, so it's very hard for me to follow. Can, can you say it again? Do we have any example where a classical physics, yes. classical physics can describe a decay of a system? A what? Decay of a system. Decay, something is decaying, a classical yes. physics can describe how it is decaying. Means what I'm asking is that is there a microscopic physics based on classical physics which can describe us decay processes? Uh, uh, you, you mean the decaying mode here? Yeah, the decaying mode here we have. My, yes. my, my point is that the presence of a decaying mode. I, I don't know why it should also feel bad. It is tiny. As long as it is non-zero, I think that proves that it is quantum in nature, not classical in nature. That's my point. Ah, okay. Yes, I agree. I agree. But, uh, okay, I get your point. I agree, but uh, it's true. It's true. I agree. But uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, I, I would like, maybe it's too ambitious, but I would like, uh, I would like to measure it in some sense using the, the Planck data. And uh, what I see is that it's present in, in, in principle, but in practice, it won't be possible. <laughs> but I agree, it, it, it shows that it's there. Yeah, it, the moment we can ascertain ourselves that it is there, that very well tells that it is not described by classical physics. This is the statement I'm making. I, I agree with this statement. I agree with this statement, yes. Uh, uh, so le let me, I am very close to the end of the talk now. Uh, so le let me just discuss with you a last slide, which is an idea to try to find uh, a way out to the, to the previous uh, conclusion. So we see that uh, we cannot measure or reproduce or mimic the cosmic bell experiment because we need to measure two non-commuting operators. And this is, this is simply not possible in practice. So uh, it would be nice if we could uh, measure only one component of these fictitious spin operators. Because only one component would require the measurement of only the growing mode. And the growing mode, we know that we can measure it. Uh, uh, so the only way out that I see at the moment is that if we want to measure only one component, we have to do it at different times. This means a different redshift because two uh, quantities evaluated at different times do not necessarily commute. And this leads to the to an, another type of uh, inequality that are known as the legged gark inequalities. So the legged gark inequalities, so the bell inequalities, they, they deal with a situation where you measure spin operators at different locations. Legged gark inequalities, you measure uh, a qubit, but at different times. So in the context of cosmology, this would mean measuring the growing mode at different redshifts. And we have checked with Vincent Venin recently that the legged gark inequalities are indeed violated for the fictitious spin operators that I have introduced before and for a two mode squeezed state. So, in principle, there is maybe a way out, and we could maybe, uh, using a measurement of the growing mode at different uh, times, we could maybe still try to design something which would allow us to. To, to, to measure a direct signature of the quantum nature of the perturbation. This is the only way out that I see to something which would be otherwise a kind of no-go theorem that you can never measure a direct signature of the quantum origin of the perturbation. So the hunt continues and this uh, leads me to my conclusion. Uh, basically, this is uh, everything I have said before, so I don't need to repeat once again what I discussed before. Maybe the only thing that I uh, can say to conclude is this uh, red takeaway message that is written at the bottom of the, of, of the slide, is that, of course, inflation is a successful scenario of the early universe. It's, it, it has a great explanatory power. It can really uh, help us a lot to understand the CMB fluctuation and to interpret the data. But it's also a, a very interesting playground for foundation, uh, foundational issues of quantum mechanics. In fact, to my knowledge, inflation is the only situation in physics where you need general relativity and quantum mechanics in a crucial way to derive the prediction of the theory and where at the same time you have high accuracy data to compare, to compare uh, with the prediction of the theory. This is the only situation, as far as I know, where these three things are true at the same time. And this makes inflation a very interesting scenario for this purpose. So with this conclusion, I stop here and I uh, thank you a lot for, this, uh, for your attention. And I hope it was not too long because I see that I have spoken for almost two hours but uh, yeah so uh, uh, thank you it, it was really nice talk and it, like we have enjoyed a lot hopefully all of you enjoyed a lot now uh, please unmute yourself and give a clap for uh, Jerome
for giving such a nice talk. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Thank you. now, now is ask questions, uh, which shouldn't be very large, long question, but you please ask question. Anybody can ask question. Yeah, Jerome. Ah, yes. I don't. I have not a question, but I have a comment. Mm -hmm. Respect all the spin operator or spin system we know in the world, but we are able to measure only the Z component, correlation of the Z component of this. Mm -hmm. We have no idea about the polarization of that particular field, uh, whether it is two polarization, would it is N polarization or zero polarization. Just because we are able to measure only one component of the polarization, it does not conclude, we cannot conclude that how many polarization states that particular field has. And this is what is your statement. Measuring the Z component only, even if at different times, does not give us full picture of that particular field or operator as long as polarization states are considered. So we need to have technology for simultaneous measurement of various polarization of the same field. Until we achieve that, I don't think we can make a conclusive statement what we are telling is true. So by the polarization, you mean the different component of the spin operators, yes. X and Y, that's right? Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I think given the magnitude of the decaying mode, uh, well, at least in the context of vanilla inflationary scenarios that, uh, you know, uh, the, the amplitude of the decaying mode is something like exponential minus 50. So I think uh, even uh, <laughs> in 1,000 1, years, uh, I, I doubt that people will develop the technology to measure it, but who knows, who knows. But at least for my lifetime, I think it's, it's, uh, it would be impossible in, in, uh, in practice. I agree, I uh, agree. Yes, and, and, and uh, I have also a comment on your comment. Um, uh, I mean, with respect to legged gark inequalities, maybe the comment that I have is that, uh, or, or the thing that I could add to your comment rather, is that it's true, I agree, that if we imagine, which uh, something which I, I am not totally convinced of, but imagine that uh, someday we can uh, measure the, only one component of the of the the z component of the of the pseudo spin operator but at different times so at different redshift imagine that we can do it and imagine that we can test the legged gark inequalities uh, the comment that i would like to add is that i think it's it is true that you uh, it would not test exactly the same assumptions as a measurement of the bell inequality you would you would uh, yeah, but the point is that when we say we'll measure the Z component of the spin at different times, yes. I'm assuming that its polarization cannot change as in, in time? Uh, no, you always measure the same component, but of course the amplitude can change with time. Amplitude can change, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. that's what I'm telling. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. But uh, yeah. what I will say is that what we do physics today does not depend on your lifetime or my lifetime. Let let other people come after after ten lifetimes and prove that what we said is wrong. If the technology has developed by that time, I'm sorry. There is a phone ringing and I cannot hear you. Whose phone it is? I don't know. <laughs> it's not mine. <laughs> Not yours. Yeah, to my secretary. I'll call her later. <laughs> what I was telling you is that there is no need for us to be depressed. Something we are not able to measure now. Mm -hmm. When it can see, for example, Higgs was discovered so many years up, after it was predicted. What we are talking theoretically, with as long as our logic is correct, no one can find a fault in our logic, and setting up the question and finding some answer. I think we'll give it to future generation, let them prove that we are wrong, but we are in the right track. And mm -hmm. I learned a lot of things from your talk 
and I'm very impressed. Just keep it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am glad that you are more optimistic than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, please ask question to him. I uh, hi, Joe. Can I have a question? Please, yes, please, sure. please ask. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk, first of all. Uh, my question is, um, so, so what you did is you started from perturbations and you quantized them. Um, yes. uh, my question is, should we expect some kind of correspondence if one started from a theory of quantum gravity, such as the wheel do it equations and calculating second perturbations to it, second order corrections to the wheel do it equations, should these two uh, ways be correspondent to each other? Starting from a quantum theory and creating corrections and or quantizing the perturbation from the beginning. That's my question. Yes, yes. So this has been done in the 80s. There is a, there is a, a paper by uh, Stephen Hawking and Jonathan Halliwell where uh, they start from the wheeler david equation and study the perturbations from the wheeler david equation. And, uh, and, and you recover exactly the same. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, but you, in, in fact, you also gain something by uh, doing the, the approach that you described, uh, namely that you can uh, relate this discussion about the initial state of the wave function of the universe with the initial state of the perturbations. And uh, uh, Hawking and Halliwell, they have shown that if you assume the non-boundary uh, state for the wave function of the universe, you basically end up, uh, this basically implies the Bunch and Davies vacuum state for the perturbations. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, which makes sense because uh, uh, the, the, no, the no boundary uh, prescription is basically a prescription to minimize initially the energy. And therefore, it makes sense that at the perturbative level, you end up with the vacuum state. But uh, they have shown explicitly that there is a correspondence between the two. So mm -hmm. I guess the answer to your question is yes, there is a direct correspondence between, uh, I mean, okay. between the two. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know. You're welcome. Next question, please. Anybody have any question? There are many people. Please ask question. Um, I have a comment, maybe, and a question. Please, please add. I, I think I posted in the chat, but it went, uh, it went uh, unnoticed. I didn't want to interrupt at the moment because it was going quickly. And uh, so it was about the spin operator and its square. Yes. Um, so I was just uh, uh, noticing that it, I wouldn't call it a projection operator. Um, because the projection operator, if we are using the same word in the same context, is uh, has this idempotency relation, whereas uh, spin is just uh, the spin operators are just defined in that way um, that they happen to square over one in in the cases. And from your calculation, from the calculation with uh, equating n and m, um, right. Yeah, from here, this is, uh, so So, each yes, term inside the integral would be a projection operator yes, for every k. Yes, this is k. what I meant. This is what ah, I meant. Ah, okay, okay, right. Yes. Yes. I, I said this is, a, this is a weighted sum with minus of one the to the yeah, right. of okay. the projector. Yes. I see, okay, sorry, I didn't really no, 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 understand no that point. Yeah, okay, thanks. And you had any a question? More, any more questions or comments? Mm. Please ask him. The students, there are lots of students. Please ask. Abhinash, do you have any question? Uh, no, no. No, I'm good. Thanks. The other students, please ask. Hi. Yeah, uh, can you speak loudly? A little bit loud. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. No, uh, I don't have a question or comment. I just wanted to note down the number of a paper you had referred to. And I, I sort of missed it. It was in one of the slides on Bell experiment. It was just before that. So could you just roll back a bit? Uh, uh, the number started with 1605.09444. Oh, I just want oh, to just oh, missed it. Uh, you uh, mean, actually, this uh, talk will be posted in YouTube. You can see the whole thing. Oh, is it? Okay, okay. Then, then I'll check it out. So yeah. I have this one, a panel. Ah, yes, this one. Ah, yes, yes, exactly. 
Hmm. Okay, 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 noted. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so I don't think there are more questions. And like, uh, I am also very sure that Jerome is also very tired after giving <laughs> the two hours long talk mm -hmm. along with huge discussion. But I hope you have also enjoyed. Sure. Uh, yes. So, uh, uh, like, so we are uh, very thankful to you for giving this uh, uh, talk and talk come lecture, you can say that. And uh, hopefully we'll, we will get back you in this forum again with some new ideas. And uh, most importantly, from all of us, we want to say, stay safe and healthy. And this is the most important thing at present and hopefully things will be get uh, very uh, soon okay so that we can all go to our institute and universities and work from there. So uh, by that note, I want to finish. And uh, yeah. I, I wanted to thank you a lot for the invitation. And I would like also to say that uh, organizing this series of seminars uh, yeah, so is like, a great idea. And I would like to, to thank you for that because I have watched so, other seminars and uh, thank really you very much is, because they are great. And uh, yeah, thank so you very I, much. I thought to uh, like this time, all the students, researchers, along with faculties, everybody should be uh, like, this is kind of a like a forum type of thing where we can actually collect all of them together and by posting all the talks in the YouTube, uh, I want to actually help students so that they can look back into the talks and get uh, like study according to the talks and that I believe will help them a lot. So thank you very the, much yeah. for that. Thank yeah. you very much for that. Uh, Jerome, one last thing. Yes. Is that? Yeah. Uh, I found this really helpful. It was brilliantly presented. Thanks a lot. I'm just my, my first year of PhD, but this was super helpful for me. Thank you. I, I'm, thank I'm you glad to much. hear that, of course. Thank you very much. So, okay. I guess I... Bye-bye. And bye -bye. Uh, again, again, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Jerome. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.